Hello and welcome to My Security TV and our Tech and Sec Weekly. My name is Chris Cubbage. I'm the executive editor with My Security Media. And today we're uh, proud to be joined by Professor Lisa Harvey Smith, who is the Women in STEM ambassador and also a professor of practice at the University of New South Wales. And also welcome to National Science Week, uh, 14th to the 22nd of August 2021. And let me just check our channels very briefly and make sure that we're going live. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and also, if we're welcome to My Security TV, we are covering off on aerospace and space, defence and national security, cybersecurity and uh, critical technology, and the cities and infrastructure. Uh, we should be going for at least 30 to 45 minutes today. And we should also be streaming on Facebook, uh, YouTube, and LinkedIn. And otherwise, you can catch us out on the Cybersecurity Weekly podcast. Just one second, I'm sorry. Sorry about that, folks. Slight distraction there. Um, so just want to catch up on what we've been doing and uh, then we'll move over to our interview with Lisa. And uh, just to catch up on last week, we did a cost of a data breach analysis of 500 plus real world data breaches. And that was with IBM Security and their Chief Technology Officer, Chris Hawkins. And that is also available as a Cybersecurity Weekly podcast. Uh, also last week, we interviewed uh, Andy Bauer, the CEO of Cleos Space and looked at uh, the Clio Space uh, Polar Vigilance mission. They've now got two clusters of satellites uh, up in, and they've got another launch coming up later this week. Uh, and likewise, these are available as standalone interviews. And also last week, we uh, were joined again by Chris Flaherty, the MySpace Warfare Analysis Lab, and looking at the space tourism sector. And it's something that we'll touch on with Lisa today uh, in relation to space and particularly her role as an astrophysicist. So looking forward to that as well. What we've got coming up on Friday is uh, looking at the APAC threat landscape and welcome and sorry and uh, welcoming WatchGuard and they're celebrating 25 years uh, in the industry. So we're going to have a look at the uh, how the industry has evolved and a look to the future as well. We're going to be joined by Corey Nantrina, who is the Chief Security Officer, and also it's Vincent Tan up there in Singapore. Uh, who is their regional director. Uh, also available, and this will be coming out as a podcast and a YouTube video as well, but it is available on demand. Uh, we did a CISO panel, a data protection considerations during a security transformation project and joined by Nick Savides of Forcepoint and looking at specifically the transformation project with Flybys uh, and Alex Lazau, their head of security. Also coming up, we've got the Security Sandbox. This is a, another podcast, Amanda Fennell, who's the CISO and CIO uh, with Relativity, and also going to be joined by the Relativity Managing Director for APAC, Georgia Foster, uh, looking into the, what, what have we said here, digging into the APAC threat landscape uh, and also the Security Sandbox podcast. Looking forward to talking to Georgia and Amanda. Uh, also coming up uh, next week or a week and a half, the 26th of August, Government and Private se Sector, Cybersecurity Protection for Critical Infrastructure, uh, and be crossing to the US with Admiral Michael Rogers and also Lani Rafiti uh, with Clarity. And just finalising, we've had a slight change on the speaker with the Australian Cybersecurity Centre, so that's going to be finalised very soon. And then the following week uh, with uh, Metric Stream, Accelerate Your Compliance Journey, looking at the uh, cybersecurity re uh, regulations, both in Singapore and in Australia, but, uh, particularly here in Australia, the IRAP, uh, CPS 234 and the Monetary Authority in Singapore and their guidelines uh, as well. So that should be a good session. It's great to have uh, Tarag Joshi joining us again. Uh, and just a couple with uh, ICADA as well. These are mid-September, preventing fraud in the digital world with early and accurate detection. Uh, and then also there's going to be a special webinar on fraud prevention with a focus on customer experience. So if you're in e-commerce uh, and anything to do with fraud protect uh, protection and prevention, uh, this is a good one with Neil Wellen, who's their principal field data scientist for APAC. Uh, and then also lined up, this is with ISACA, and this is part two of their annual research. We have been joined by Janaya Marinkovic, I beg your pardon, and Jonathan Brandt uh, previously. They're both in the US, uh, but this is part two of their annual research 
for the state of cybersecurity. So again, looking at that, uh, looking forward to that one. And also, again, maybe relating to our interview today with, uh, with Lisa, we uh, interviewed Lynette Tan, the Chief Executive for Singapore Space and Technology, uh, the space sector in Asia, and getting perspective of uh, the SSTL's role uh, from Singapore in the space industry. And then also, uh, also with uh, Jane Lowe, our Singapore correspondents, uh, uh, sorry, beg your pardon, our correspondent, uh, looking at the $900 million acquisition of Extra Hop. And again, very good uh, interview with Chris Lehman there, the Chief Revenue Officer, particularly for your cybersecurity startup or a tech startup of any of any form. Uh, Jane takes uh, Chris through that particular process uh, of uh, how Extra Hop went from their series funding uh, all the way through to a major acquisition. And also, uh, there's now a number of interviews there with uh, Jessica Bainbridge, our My, MySmartTech.tv channel, and our Best in Tech uh, channel as well. So please check out Jess uh, hosting our new show. Uh, and again, she's doing some great work and some great lineups coming through. So that's MySmartTech.tv. And then also later this month, 31st of August, we've got our top women in security ASEAN region. This is on the 31st of August at 5 p.m. Uh, Singapore time. Uh, so this is we will be the awards ceremony announcing the top 30 women in security in the ASEAN region. And just finishing off, highlighting the latest editions of Cyberist Leaders magazine and also the Australian Cybersecurity magazine are now out and available. Thank you to our sponsor, Secure ID, uh, an RSA business, uh, for their sponsorship for this series. And if you want to support the channel, please check out our merchandise store uh, on the My Security Marketplace. That is enough for me. And apologies for the uh, interruption there at the start. Uh, but ma let me welcome uh, our special guest today, Professor Lisa Harvey-Smith, Women in STEM Ambassador, Professor of Practice at the University of New South Wales uh, for National Science Week. Uh, Lisa, thanks for joining us. Good day, Chris. Nice to be here. <laughs> very good. Um, sorry, I had a very interesting interruption there halfway through, so I had to stop that. Um, Lisa, maybe welcome to National Science Week. This is probably a busy week for you as we go through. Maybe introduce us to what National Science Week is about and then your role as uh, a Women in STEM ambassador as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, yeah, happy National Science Week, everyone. It's really an opportunity that, you know, every year across Australia that we have to um, really have community-led and science and research sector-led um, activities that young people and older people alike can uh, get to understand what science is and, and how science evolves as well beyond um, what you learn at school. Um, so this year, a lot of lockdowns going on, maybe not so many in-person events, but we've got literally hundreds of online events uh, across the country and um, certainly many scientists taking part in those. Um, and it's, you know, it's really important um, in times like these when we've got really topical issues um, like vaccines and uh, disease spread and um, you know climate change lots and lots of big issues but also emerging technologies as well and um, trying to introduce those concepts to people gradually um, year on year so that they really appreciate and understand what's going on so national science week's uh, you know busy week for me and, uh, and many others like me i think it's in terms of the well, i was going to say it's hashtag national science week so if people want to find out that uh, or getting involved with the online events, it probably opens up a little bit more uh, in that regard as well, right? Yeah, that's right. I mean, you can go on um, science, uh, I think scienceweek.net.au okay. as well and type in your postcode. And But pretty much everything's online, so it's a little yeah. bit irrelevant where you live nowadays. Um, but certainly when I typed in uh, my area, there were just uh, about 250 events for this week, so superb okay. stuff. Well, really it's good cool. for the schools to get involved, and that maybe that will guide us into the the STEM ambassadorship as well of uh, what your focus is, and uh, and again how that relates back to say something like National Science Week. Mm. Well, I was just happily, you know, working as a astrophysics researcher, um, and uh, I was asked by the government if I'd be interested in um, a new role that had just been announced, which was the Australian government's Women in STEM ambassador. Um, so what that is, it's um, the, the government's very sensibly uh, acknowledged that um, in order to support 
Australia's industry in particular, um, we need those growing skill areas um, and requirements like STEM, science, technology, engineering and maths um, to be filled. So we need young people to actually understand um, how to reason, how to think critically, how to do mathematics and, and engineering and how to create um, new businesses, products and services uh, using those skills. So you know, fast growing industries, I'm sure a lot of your listeners will, will know about that. Um, but but to, to do that, um, we have to plug some of the real gaps and many of the gaps are to do with gender. And there's a big gender segregation between different industries, you know, health and medical sciences, uh, nursing in particular, very female dominated, um, engineering, um, ICT, very male dominated. So, you know, we're trying to plug those gaps um, and to use research to actually understand what the origins of some of those um, some of those decisions that young people are making uh, on the, the subjects that they're studying at school, uh, what are the influences on young people, and then to really act on those stereotypes and try and change them. So I work in my team, um, I've got psychologists, social psychologists, I've got um, you know, education specialists, I've got um, people from the museum sector, uh, and just just great experts from um, all across the sector. And we're, we're very data driven. So we we look at uh, why things are happening and we try and sort of tackle those things at the at the root. Any any uh, early answers that are popping out to you in that? And something we talked about just pre interview was uh, keeping women uh, in the workforce in STEM environments as well. Uh, yeah, what are some of the, the key things that you think come out early? And anyone watching this interview might sort of stay for the first half at least. Uh, what yeah. are those key messages that you think you've got or some of the key changes that need to be start to be made or are being made? Yeah, well, this, it's the first thing is that it, there's no civil bullet. It's a very complex area. So there's a different different places where women are um, making decisions, um, you know, based on what's sensible for them, what's best for them. Uh, and we've also got the social stereotypes that are influencing that. So research shows that um, parents of toddlers um, talk to their kids very differently depending on the kid's gender. So research from the US showed that um, the parents of um, boys, uh, toddler age, two to three years old, um, are, are three times more likely to talk about numbers and counting than they are with their girls right. at the same age. So just from that very young age, um, there are there are real differences in our behaviour and, and what we reinforce with young people. Um, so looking at research like that and looking at uh, the points throughout a child's life where they start to make decisions, they start to form attitudes, it shows that really we have to look at primary school attitudes um, we have to work with teachers and parents to change the way that they actually interact and the things that they reinforce with young people so I've worked over the last two years spoken to more than 11,000 teachers um, showing them evidence around what kind of effect that attitudes of adults can have on children and where they make those um, make, the, make those decisions about education uh, you know girls thinking engineering is not for me uh, that a lot of that comes from from uh, adult influences, and then we've got a campaign called Future You, which is a national awareness raising initiative, which is funded by the um, the Department of Industry and the federal government. And um, we've got this fantastic website um, for primary age kids, and we've created a bunch of animated characters, and they're all STEM professionals, but they're kind of cool and they've got interesting jobs. Um, we're, we're just looking for our cyber security character, hopefully later nice. this year. Uh, so people out there uh, get in touch if you're interested in that. But um, we've got people from the space agency. Um, we've got ecologists, people working on things that young people care about, like climate change and making the world better and health and, um, you know, environmental uh, improvements and, and those kind of, you know, parts of STEM that kids can get excited about. Um, so we've got role models, um, we've got people with disability, and we've got different genders, different cultural backgrounds, uh, and we're trying to create this uh, really exciting, engaging website where kids can go on, they can play games, and, and that, you know, that's, that's part of driving the change in their attitudes at that young age. The second what, part of it, did, though, is, back, is what going, happens go. in the workforce. <laughs> go, I mean, yes. you know, we, we talked about this earlier, sorry, but... Um, you know, what, what happens after kids get into STEM, they study at university, we know more women are studying uh, science than ever before, um, but when they get into workplaces, 
Are they supported? Are they expected to do more unpaid work and caring? Um, after they have children, can they get back into the workplace? Um, you know, are they paid equally? And the answer is no. Um, spoiler alerts. So there are lots of influences um, in the workplace as well, including workplace culture, harassment, and so on. So it's a pretty complex story. It is complex. I mean, I've got, at least I could always say I've got a couple of daughters as well that have get, gone through uni and the like, and I've always said to them that they're always going to be involved with technology. It's just that's where thing, you know, technology is everywhere these days. One of the questions I had was, is there anything, uh, and I do have some chats here, so if anyone does have any questions, uh, they're welcome to ask uh, Lisa here or any comments as well uh, that what your observations are, but otherwise let us know where you're listening from. Anything that you think, looking back to your childhood, what would what was the difference? Uh, because there's not a lot of women in space. I mean, if we just looked at, regardless of STEM, women in space are going alone. Uh, there's a limited number as well. Anything there that sparked your interest and, uh, yeah, your your journey where you thought there was a turning point for you? Yeah, yeah. I um. I had an interesting upbringing. Um, I, I was born in 1979. That, those sort of times, um, men went out to work and women stayed at home. That was generally yeah. what happened. Um, and my dad stayed at home with the kids. My mum went out to work. So that was kind of a, a different experience in the, in the home that already um, probably contributed to my attitudes that, you know, why why can't I do anything? Why can't I be an astrophysicist? Um, that was my interest when I was a kid. I was more into sports and stuff. But one night, my dad and I went out and looked at the stars. And a lot of people have this story, you know, you, you go out and look at the stars, you're camping or something, and you just have this wow moment. You go, wow, this is incredible. And we saw the planet Mars. And um, I think I was about 12. And um, we'd, we'd had a sort of abortive attempt to see Halley's Comet in 1986. Um, but it was cloudy, so <laughs> yeah. unfortunately that, that wasn't where my interest uh, started. But after that, I just got obsessed and I started reading, pouring through star atlases. And, um, you know, at that time there was no internet, no computer sort of stuff. So it was it was all very practical. Um, joined my local astronomy club and, um, you know, saw role models on TV, um, TV presenters on BBC documentaries and that kind of thing. And I think, um, you know, reading a lot of books as well, the authors really inspired me, um, you know, male and female. Um, so, yeah, there weren't many female role models, like you say. Um, but, uh, you know, for me, I, I think my upbringing helped me believe and uh, you know affirm that I could do anything I wanted to and I think that's the great thing that I've been given by my parents the you know the, a house full of books and, and questions and discussions and that's something anyone can give to their child. And the the change over that period of time you've been even in your role for a few years now as well uh, and sort of uh, you know a 20 odd year career that the change is it encouraging for you because they're you do get some stats, and I will go through some stats uh, shortly, but you do hear that it's up and down or it's very slow. It's uh, that projection even on, say, uh, salary equality is, you know, potentially another generation away. Uh, where, where's, the, where's some pros and cons for you uh, that you're observing in the changes? Yeah, I think I think it depends on the sector and on the environment. So yeah. I've always been in the kind of uh, more academic area. I've not worked in private business, but I work in the CSIRO and other in different countries, similar organisations. And there's certainly a, a difference in culture now that the, they're getting much stricter on organisational, um, you know, workplace culture and, um, you know, lower tolerance for poor behavior and professional behavior in workplaces uh, certainly a lot of people now being trained not to do wrong things not sexual harassment and that kind of stuff um, and certainly the figures are going up the number of young women who are choosing engineering science technology subjects ict um, but they're going up very slowly so um, you know two two percent uh a year would be a great jump and we've seen that in one or two areas but but otherwise it's a, a you know a few years a yeah. good few years before we get a one percent increase um in say women studying physics so um it's creeping up 
workplaces are changing, but academia isn't changing fast enough. Um, and small to medium enterprises are certainly another area where culture very much is driven by one or two individuals. You, you've really yeah. got to, I guess, if you're running an organization, really keep that eye on, um, you know, the, the, the culture and values of the organization, having that open, inclusive kind of culture where everyone's really valued. The, the language is, you think the, the, there's a lot around the language, even at, at early childhood development as well. Mm. Parents are ingrained, you know, again, if I <laughs> look at even my language as a, as a father, but definitely my dad's language, you know, we've got to change. It's a cultural change. It's a long, it's a generational change. Uh, the language, do you think it's coming along okay or better? Uh, is there any is language really quite strong, particularly for early childhood and early school years as well, on how it divides? Yeah. Is that uh, unconscious bias in our language? Yeah, I think it's really important. And I, I sometimes, I don't have children myself, but I sometimes reflect when I talk to children in schools and, you know, how you address a young boy as opposed to a young girl. Um, Even uh, tone and, and certainly when, can change. Yeah, tone, what you reinforce, um, calling them champ or mate. You can guess which gender that is, um, as opposed to darling, sweetheart, pretty, you look pretty in that dress, and boys like, oh, you're strong. You know, there's very, very clear differences in the way that, that we try and reinforce behaviours of young people. I'm no psychologist, so I won't pretend to be, but um, certainly I've read some of the research around how strong an influence language is. It's not that we're trying to, um, you know, force children to be... Uh, all robots and just speak to them in a you know completely stilted way but it's it's very interesting how through different generations we we have habits that we don't necessarily notice the other thing is you know you walk around let's say Kmart or a shop like that you look at the children's clothes and toys and mm. um, it's quite stark um, you've got your dinosaur jumpers you've got your um, rocket ship you know, pajamas, uh, and or you've got your princesses and unicorns. So, I think that's actually got worse since the nineteen uh, seventies and eighties, um, when people were becoming a little bit more enlightened about gender and the effect um, that they were having on young people's aspirations, and and quite frankly, limiting girls' um, aspirations with regards to um, a lot of you know technical subjects which yeah. is is such a shame because it should be down to each individual's um aptitudes and interests um and absolutely if they're a girl and they love makeup and hair that's great they're, they're allowed to but it's you know are they genuinely interested in that or is it actually something that's just been they been tend not to have a choice i think if i'm thinking of say a supermarket they're they're separated uh you know the colors are different the way it's done is different and so you don't have these there's no choice really is there than uh, there's no uh, bringing it together. So we're, we're doing from the start. And maybe that brings us to the office of uh, women in STEM that you've established as well. And what are the priorities for that? Uh, mm. You're obviously looking at all of government, uh, all of societal, societal approaches as well, um, as well as just STEM. So where would say, what's your strategy uh, going forward? Are you working to a strategy, I'm assuming? Yeah, absolutely. We um, One of the first things I did um, was work with an amazing team from the Australian Academy of Science, the Australian Academy of Technology and Engineering, so the peak bodies for, for sort of science and tech size of, of, um, of Australian industry and, and academia. And um, we got together some expert panels um, different from different parts of the sector, say from industry, education, research. And um, we, we worked on um, a decadal plan, so a 10 year plan for women in STEM based on research, based on hundreds of research papers from you know, psychology and social science and, and STEM research from every, every part of research about why people choose STEM, why people leave STEM, why people hate STEM uh, <laughs> and you know, all, of, all of those things because it's boring. Um, so we're looking at um, who are you know, these some people? Of those, I, I, I don't, know, I don't, I don't get it. I mean, even I when you think it. about, and sorry to interrupt, but it's one of those, STEM is such a broad science, technology, engineering and maths. Uh, there's nothing there that can't be interesting or adapted to be interesting. Uh, is it... Um, is it getting have you women... read a textbook though? I mean, have you, have you <laughs> well, read one recently? Yeah, well, I suppose, but maybe it's making well, it more um, 
uh, applied sciences. Uh, and is it, is it that it. type of thing where you get get you hit the nail on the head? Really, yeah. It's, it's I mean, about without doing, separating boys about, and girls, if you get them hands yeah, on, it's about the why. Yeah, and but just the hands on of discovery, Absolutely. and then you have to read textbooks after that to work out why did that just happen. Yeah, and all you have to do is get and them asking the question, right? That's it. So, I mean, that sort of reminds me, it's why I write books, because so many things are boring in life. You know, people, I don't know how people do it, but they manage to present things in a boring way. So I just sort of knew I had to quickly get all my knowledge out before I forgot. Um, <laughs> when you get older, you forget everything. So <laughs> yes. uh, I just thought in my 40s, I'll just write a bunch of books. Um, but, yeah, seriously, the, the research shows very much that to engage um more girls in STEM, but also um, boys who have different types of interests that aren't necessarily those technological interests. Um, you have to motivate them. So kids do best when they learn collaboratively. Um, so they work in teams, in schools, they identify a real world problem that they care about. Um, and that might be anything in their community, in their environment, uh, it might be a challenge, it might be building a solar car, but something hands-on and that they actually do it. They design it, they think it through, they build it, and they, they've got that kind of process um, learning, that engineering system learning. Um, and that can help you then to understand the process of how science technology is done. And then, you know, you can really see yourself in that kind of um, workplace. And, and also the, the visits to industry sites as well is so important, even if it's a small local business, uh, manufacturing some, you know, components. Or I remember as a kid going to space school in the summer, uh, you know, didn't have many opportunities, but that was an incredible one to visit the satellite factory yeah. in, near London, um, near where I grew up. And it was just incredible to put on that clean suit and actually watch this part of a satellite that was going to be launched into space. And that's when you start to join up the dots between what you're learning in the textbook and the real world. And you start to say, oh, that's why I need Pythagoras. That's why I need to learn mm -hmm. integration or differentiation. Whatever it is, there's, you know, you've got to, as you say, you've got to do the hard stuff, you've got to do the textbook stuff. Um, but first you've got to understand the why. Otherwise you don't care. You don't care. Yeah. That's Do you find that um, we're up against social media as well these days? And but there's always a divide, uh, you know, even in the sort of the, the male domain of uh, sort of the, the the jock kind of kind of guys who just want to play football and not be interested in in sort of a STEM background. Uh, is there any inhibitors there? Do you think you know real real barriers there? Uh, today uh, or that are inhibiting potential change? I think um, there's a few parts to that. So there's sort of stereotypes. So if you've ever seen the Big Bang Theory and who can avoid it if you're flicking over on the TV, it's constantly on. Um, <laughs> you know, it's like Friends now, it's constantly on the television. <laughs> but, um, you know, if you don't know, if you're not familiar with it, it's a show about some astrophysicists. They're extremely geeky. They're male, they're socially awkward and they're geniuses. Um, and um, it's pretty it's pretty funny, but it's pretty awful in terms of stereotypes and perpetuating those lone genius, socially awkward stereotypes that make people not want to be a scientist. Yeah. Um, you know, who what kid wants to be uncool and not be able to, you know, talk to other young people? Um, so it's it's pretty it's pretty harsh um, that we're still kind of perpetuating these stereotypes. Um, and you know, that's definitely a barrier. So someone sees themselves as sporty um, or, you know, cool, then they don't want to be a scientist. That's a, that's a problem. Um, but in terms of social media, you know, I, th I think there's this great um, young astrophysics PhD student called Kirsten Banks at the University of New South Wales. And um, she has a TikTok account um, and TikTok's this, you know, new social media, yeah. cutting edge, young people only. And, uh, you know, she's got over 100,000 followers. I don't know how many now, but it's, it went up exponentially really quickly through COVID. And, um, you know, she does astrophysics facts videos right. every day. And, you know, how great is that? It's not just makeup videos and uh, people dancing, which is fine. But, um, you know, there's, there's great stuff on there too. Well, maybe that is the answer is you've got to flip it around and take it on rather other than potentially let it beat you. And I think you're right. Yeah. But I don't see a lot. I do do waste some time on TikTok mm. and I don't get a sense that there's a lot. But there are, you know, even with misinformation campaigns, 
uh, I think there is a, an avenue there. Some of the stats here, and maybe what are you doing with um, sort of broader industry or larger industries? Uh, there's a good stat here, uh, and I've just lost it. We'll grow, but 20 Australian workers will spend 77% more time using science mm -hmm. and maths by 2030. And I do a report of the day uh, on the end of these as well, and uh, I'm going to raise one with skills. Um, and then this is a this was the one I was looking for. And then extra sixty beg your pardon, an extra six percent of women in the workforce could add up to twenty five billion dollars to Australia's gross gross domestic product. That's from the Gretton Institute. Those are the types of numbers that I think business mm -hmm. would listen to, and I don't think there's a lack of appreciation of that. Uh, is it not? becoming increasingly important now, given borders are locked down, immigration's lower. Mm. We don't really have much of a choice but to get more women into STEM and into the workforce. Yeah, that's it. And uh, I thought, I think, honestly, when I talk to industry leaders and I talk to groups like the Champions of Change Coalitions, a lot of CEOs from uh, across the sector, I talk to, you know, chief executive women, uh, industry groups, uh, yeah. People, people in a lot of STEM industries now really understand this. Um, we're not really coming up against resistance now. It's people, people in senior positions understand this and they know it to be true. Um, and the government as well, you know, is is supporting things like um, the STEM Returners Program, the um, STEM Industry PhD scholarships um, to get you know university sector people and industry people talking to each other that's such uh, a key to this and to have mobility between the two sectors as well so you know if you're doing research um, uh, applied research in you know, so a university setting that you can apply that and, and get the entrepreneur entrepreneurial part um, sorted as well um, incubators accelerators you know through CSIRO and other organizations um, and, and you know upskilling researchers to actually go into industry create useful products and services so it's that whole ecosystem that is really strong in places like Germany that we need to embrace uh, and I, I've been seeing you know people have been very receptive to that but certainly with a gender angle you have to um, increase specific opportunities for a short period of time while you make the adjustment um, in an industry that is so male dominated. And then once you get a critical mass, hopefully then it, it sort of takes care of itself. You always have to be vigilant with um, all industries to have a, yeah. a, a workplace that's you know great for everyone uh, and is able to retain staff because even if you know, a theoretical company that didn't care about its employees' well-being. They don't want turnover. It's expensive and it's tiresome. So, you know, we train uh, lots of women into STEM, um, but five years after graduation, um, female STEM graduates, uh, only one in ten of them are working in STEM. So it's pretty. It's pretty dire. What? What? What, what explains that part? Is it just going and having a family not coming back, or? Uh, the workplace no. was, you know, or is it yeah. cultural where they're just going, I'm not yeah. putting up with that, I'm out? It's very cultural um, and especially in certainly I've seen reports in the engineering sector is very, very cultural. Um, and, and it's about, um, it, it starts from the very first moment you leave university and your first job, um, there, depending on the industry, that's between um, $16,000 a year and $20,000 a year gender pay gap. Yeah. With okay. identical yeah. qualifications working full-time we're not comparing like you know part-time hours to full-time hours just the identical job identical conditions a uh, huge pay gap um, it's demoralizing women are less likely to you know be given the plum projects the exciting stuff that's going to get you um, you know in exciting places um, to get promotions um, and then you know with things like harassment and poor Poor environments. Certainly, when I was doing my PhD, there were um, unsavory calendars in all the workshops, and you know, just things you shouldn't have to um, in the two thousands. You shouldn't really have to endure at work. No women's toilet in the engineering department. You know, just things, simple things that can be fixed very simply. So I think, um, uh, and and then not closing the door as well. <laughs> well, okay, well that, I even mentioned yeah. not to put up with that. But I'm just no. thinking, we, it, it is. Potentially even because I'm, you know, I'm 50. So women, when I was uh, an ex-police, so 
there were still women uh, first time in certain units. So it's not this. It, we're still early days when the reality yeah. is. I mean, you would have seen it in your lifetime too. And you talk about that type of workplace where today, you know, that wouldn't be tolerated. I surely not. So um, I'd put anyone on notice. Be that still do that <laughs> if you're leaving the door open. It's a no no. Yeah. But you know, it still is kind of early days. Do you find that kind of potentially encouraging that a bit like technology, it's it's increasing, uh, you know, yes, and, the and there, won't phase, a, there won't be, yeah, but there won't be a choice. We will need to get women into STEM simply because we the, the current workforce won't cut it anyway. Do you think there's going to be a yeah, natural I mean, drive and push for it? There, there will be um, and there will absolutely have to be, like you say, with COVID and the lack of skilled migration, my goodness, you know, people are going to struggle. I mean, you know, in my previous job at CSIRO, when I was um, a group leader running a group of 30 scientists and engineers, and we were trying to recruit, you know, top people who could really deliver high quality global projects. Um, and, and, you know, almost all the good applicants that we got from overseas, because there's, you know, billions of people in the world and only 25 million in Australia. So it's just you know, statistically unlikely that um, you know, we're going to be able to find everyone from from the country, but um, you know that's how science and tech work. Your you, your audience will understand that, and um, it's going to be a lot of talent from uh, places that we we can't get in. So it's really urgent. Like it's really incumbent on us to create um, pathways, not just for people to um, upskill. You know, 18 years old, make sure they're training and and learning the right things. Um, but also to reskill adults who have been in another industry, yeah. pot potentially an unrelated one. And there are certainly companies doing that. They're bringing people in on on scholarships. They're paying for them to, um, you know, educate themselves in particular, um, you know, coding skills, programming languages, and then giving them a, an apprenticeship as a, you know, forty five year old potentially. Um, so it's upskilling, reskilling, and also making sure that the people who drop out of STEM work for whatever reason, it might be to have kids or to do other things with their life, they can come back. So we've got to be a bit more flexible, I think, and um, make sure people to... know you, you don't have one shot at life. You can have a few goes. We have covered off on career transition. There's a lot of career transitions into cybersecurity, and a lot of women are do it, doing that. One comes to mind, went from safety into into cyber security and again there was a lot of uh, synergies between the two um there's a current call on with all the kids i feel feel for the year 11s and 12s right now mm. in the last couple of years of fast tracking them into uni or opening up the spots into uni despite what their atars might be what are your thoughts on that and is that a potential opportunity where we can take down those sort of traditional barriers and have some new approaches yeah, I think I think that's quite healthy. Um, as we know, a lot of young people won't be as good at uh, exams. Their exam results won't be won't be as high as others because they don't have the same opportunities. You go to a private independent school, you're going to get better grades with the same human being, same brain. Um, yeah. It's it's sometimes down to that, sometimes down to illness. Um, you know, mental health is a big problem with young people, and um, you know. Physical health problems can cause um, poorer exam grades. So, giving people a chance, I think, and you know, giving them a, a real opportunity to to shine in something that they that they have an aptitude and interest for. It's not about forcing people who aren't interested to you know you're going to be a cyber expert, you're going to be a, um, you know an IT um, professional, but if they've got some sort of interest and aptitude, then giving people an opportunity, I think, is very healthy. Um, and I've never been a big fan of, of um, you know, things like exam results as a marker for um, future success. I, I really have not. Um, and I've seen that in academia so many times. People who get the, the first class degrees and not necessarily the ones who end up being professors. Um, and sometimes it's a lot of transferable skills that you need to. We talked about programming, something you can potentially learn programming, but things like maths, uh, high level engineering, is a little bit hard to to transition mm. into though is it not is it one of those things yeah. that potentially you've got to have a certain standard you know regardless of uh, your your um your background and the like there is always that that cut off in this area because it you know when you talk about space and rocket launches and 
you know, building bridges and the like. You don't want someone going. Yeah, yeah we. Sorry, man. We don't want another Tacoma <laughs> Narrows bridge, do we? But um, you know, when when we're talking about um, you know a, an engineering, um, you know, when we talk about STEM, we're not necessarily talking about people who are fully designing uh, an entire complex system. Sometimes it's people who use STEM in their roles. For example, if you um, you know train in, in medical fields and you become a medical physicist, you could you could come to that from a physics background and have no knowledge of medicine, or you could come to it potentially from the from the other side. So I think it's being a little bit open about um, you know things that don't require the absolute hardcore um, quantum mechanics or you know very very complex and deep knowledge of subjects where where people can actually learn to be part of a team and collaborate and, and contribute um, using STEM skills. And again, a lot of things are semi-automated now as well. There are yeah. a lot of software um, packages that help us in our roles. One good example with you know, my job using a huge radio telescope or an array or network of radio telescopes, um, you know, searching the universe for radiation from a gravitational wave caused by two black holes colliding. Um, somebody without a degree can actually do the observations and then somebody with a PhD does the interpretation and someone writes the paper. So you've got, you know, you've got a whole team with different skills, mix of different skill sets uh, and software that's helping us achieve that. So, um, you know, it's great teamwork and, and STEM can be so many things. I think that's the key message to get across is it's always multidisciplinary. There's no one person doing everything. Uh, it's always a team effort. And I think that's something that's come out of cybersecurity as well that we've definitely seen. Uh, women uh, have been brought in and they, they have softer skills. They bring that diversity of thought. We deal a lot with risk management too. So, again, that diversity when you're looking at risk uh, is also critical and uh, it's the communication skills but often women is getting those role models uh, is there anything there that you're working on or seeing to develop women as as spokespeople uh, you know to to give a voice and also to as a sort of a role model as well mentors and, and the like yeah there's a lot going on with um, you know industry um, mentoring programs but we've got something as well called superstars of stem um, which is a program, again, funded by the Department of Industry is doing a lot of the women in STEM stuff. And um, it's run by Science and Technology Australia and uh, is training up every year 40 uh, STEM professionals from vastly different um, fields. Uh, and women are getting uh, media trained. So we've, we're working along sort of the lines that the ABC has recently. Notice the ABC has got more, a lot more diverse more, yep. more recently in the last couple of years. Um, and it's actually had a secret um, project um, for 50-50 representation in all its its news uh, and in its experts who uh, go on the television and, and share their knowledge. So we're trying to support that by training more and more women's STEM professionals to actually um, put themselves forward to be on a register um, for media um, comments and so that everyone's expertise is getting out there. Uh, but, you know, a lot of the networks have a long way to go. You, you look at the commercial channels, it's just yep. everyone looks the same. Well, even uh, ours, so it's, I mean, it's I, I'll even say I get I get frustrated. Uh, I'll get more no's from ladies too, though, I've got to say. We've mm -hmm. got to, you got to yeah. really push them. And I think it's something I would, that's something I would recommend is, uh, you know, the more women, uh, well, just getting their confidence up, I think, is something that we just find uh, we tend to get more no's, uh, unfortunately. It's just one of those things that we can't change. We just keep yeah. asking. But that, that's, yeah. that's a common factor. And, and one of the things that may contribute to that um, is the, um, the burden. So when women are in such a minority, and people are rightly so trying to increase the, the, the prominence of women, you know, uh, spokespeople, experts, um, we get asked to do a lot of things, like a lot yeah. of things. Um, so, you know, it's where, whether it's hiring committees at work or, um, you know, we're sitting on, on committees or boards or uh, whatever it is, there's, there's a lot of good stuff it, going on. But okay. um, sometimes I, you got to protect yourself from that as well. So it's a, it's a difficult balance to get right. No, I think it's a fair, definitely a very fair comment, I think, because, again, that numbers are low. I think it's around 14 15% in cyber. 
uh, where most of our, our content is. And not only the harder to find, but obviously, as you say, the burden is more on those that are doing well. Uh, hence why we do things like the Top Women Security uh, sort of a series as well. Like you, they stand mm -hmm. out. But you do get a sense those ones that are, find their voice uh, are excellent. It's getting the, the others up to give them an opportunity as well. So, yeah. but, yeah, it's something I've noticed on ours. It's like, okay, we've got to really get our diversity up, uh, and it's uh, sometimes easier said than done, but we'll, we'll keep trying. And hence why it was a real privilege to have you on with us uh, today, Lisa. Uh, and thank you so much for your time. Any any takeaways? What's your uh, the rest of twenty twenty one looking like when you're not <laughs> locked down? Um, yeah. yeah. What's your what's your focus and even potentially a highlight for National Science Week? Oh, I mean, th th there are you know hundreds and hundreds of events. I was talking to Nate Byrne yesterday on ABC Breakfast News, um, yep. you know, about National Science Week, and he gets very excited um, about it. I do too. Um, you know, coming up, uh, you know, we've got just hundreds of events that young people, hopefully if they're um, being homeschooled at the moment, can can do with their parents and share. Um, and I, I've actually written two more books and it's kind of a fortuitous time for, for kids um, that are coming out next month called, um, the first one's called Little Book, Big Universe, which is a, a guide to Australian night sky. So hopefully that will get in the, the hands of many, many thousands of Australian kids um, and it will help them to understand the night sky. And, and uh, the other one's called Aliens and Other Worlds about uh, yeah. the wonderful um, the, the sort of origins of, of life on Earth and whether life could exist in our solar system. So, you know, it's trying to, trying to educate kids um, that there is so much out there. It's not necessarily teaching them individual things. It's, it's allowing them to explore and allowing them to see um, not just what could be possible, but to imagine themselves in that future. And that's what our Future You campaign does. Um, we'll be launching several more characters this year, um, hopefully a cyber one and uh, lots of others, uh, really representing the jobs of the future. So that's the kind of feel-good project that I do. I do a lot of other stuff like, you know, working with government and industry um, and, and advising government on, on uh, projects. But... Um, Working with kids, you can't really yeah. replace that because uh, <laughs> they, they give you a lot back. They really do. Well, maybe one last thing I'd like to leave is with this, the Australian space sector. We do a lot and we're building up our, our, our sort of space uh, content as well. Mm. And the more we look at space, uh, particularly here in Australia, it becomes quite exciting. Um, yeah, how confident are you with, with uh, the future for the Australian space sector? It's a focus for the government moving forward. Uh, a lot of opportunity, yeah? It's extraordinary. Um, I'm actually on the advisory board to the Australian Space Agency. Yep. And since it was um, launched um, two and a half, three years ago now, it's just been extraordinary. I mean, it's stated aims. It's very different from NASA. It's not that we launch Australians into space and they float around, um, but it's that we, we really create a space industry. And there are so many space businesses now getting seed funding, getting uh, venture capital funding from overseas. Uh, and the aim is just to create, uh, triple, treble the, the space industry to $12 billion um, contribution to GDP and also uh, to 20 Really cool. There's, there's so much going on from, you know, creation of aims that work on robots that will help us, um, you know, do better, make the better decisions when on spacecraft uh, around Mars, um, to things that track space junk, space debris that could um, damage or even... Uh, destroy you know, satellites that are that are up there, and even laser technologies that are trying to sort of pew pew shoot the, the space <laughs> junk out into space. So it sounds pretty futuristic, but there's a lot going on. It's happening, um, isn't the it? inter internet of things, you know, the connectivity, the Earth observation, helping farmers to you know track um, water uh, and and dis diseases and and track their livestock from space. Um, bushfire management from space uh, and rocket companies like Gilmore Space um, creating low-cost hybrid, hybrid rockets on the Gold Coast. So there is a lot going on. It's very positive. Um, and I can see a lot of these will break out and actually become, you know, long-term yeah. projects that are, are major employers and actually, you know, real high-tech industries for Australia, which is great. Well, we didn't really touch on the SKI, uh, S SKA either. No. Um, and that's... You know, where is that? What's what's the status with that one? Uh, yeah. 
Well, just to recap in case anyone's not familiar, but the SKA is the Square Kilometre Array, which is a radio telescope project. Uh, I've been involved in that for more than 12 years. I was previously the project scientist for the SKA um, in Australia for CSIRO. And uh, in 2012, we, we bid for Australia, like a bit like an Olympics bid yeah. to host the telescope. Um, we and South Africa were successful. So there's going to be uh, thousands of radio antennas in Australia in WA and um, thousands, hundreds in, in uh, South Africa. To the, the point of it is to look at the history of the universe and understand stars, galaxies, black holes, uh, the, the fundamental forces of nature. And we're currently just about starting construction. So the site is being prepared. Um, the Pathfinder telescopes, which have previously been built, um, are working now, They're producing great science. Um, I was working on that for a very long time as well. Um, so it's great to see everything working, um, the construction phase coming, a lot of opportunities for industry um, to create software, to create hardware, um, infrastructure, and uh, it's all very exciting. So there's a lot of great stuff young people can look forward to. It's and, also putting um, Australia on the map. I'm a proud West, yeah, I'm a proud West Australian as well. So it's putting sort of West Australia on the map. Uh, and as you say, the amount of science that will come out of that uh, is going to be phenomenal uh, as well. So uh, quite a game changer, really, yeah? Absolutely. Yeah, it's um, it's it's hard to overstate the the importance of the mm. project as a global radio astronomy. I've worked in Germany, Netherlands, UK in, in radio astronomy, and this has been talked about my whole career. You know, since I graduated with a PhD in two thousand two or two thousand, whenever it was, I can't remember <laughs> so long ago. But um, it was yeah, it was really talked about then. It was the project of the future, a global collaborative project, something that will help us literally see to the beginning of the universe and see everything in it and that's like phenomenal. We're, we're creating um, a real, real new chapter here in, in our understanding of the universe and its fundamental um, physical forces uh, things like dark matter dark energy gravitational waves the, the nature of gravity what is it we don't know so um, it's huge and uh, great to put Australia on the map again Absolutely. I think the stat is it, it's going to create more data in the first hour than we've ever created uh, completely as well. So, yep. Uh, All the yeah, cat videos quite... on the internet, <laughs> more than that. Um, and one last question from Nick. And Nick, thanks for your contribution. Uh, where can I purchase the books for the kids? Uh, they're great to introduce kids to the wider knowledge of the universe. Uh, are oh, they out yet? Nice. Or they'll yeah, be yeah. Uh, well, um... Yeah, so you could jump on my website, lisaharveysmith.com, and I actually yeah. sign books so people can buy them for their kids. I can sign it with a little message for your child with their name and everything. Uh, so, yeah, jump on lisaharveysmith.com. Okay. You can I'll buy them on the... Amazon, but I don't like giving Jeff Bezos money. He doesn't need yeah. any more. <laughs> uh, lisaharveysmith.com. We'll put that in the show notes as well. Uh, but, Lisa, thank you so much uh, for your time today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Women in STEM, National Science Week, uh, goes through to the 22nd. Uh, Women in STEM Ambassador, Professor of Practice at the University of New South Wales. Uh, Lisa, thank you so much for your time uh, here in our Tech and Sec Weekly. Cheers. Good on you. Thank you. I'll put you backstage and I'm just going to do our report of the day. And, uh, yeah, I'll, you're welcome to, to move on or I'll uh, come back to you. Fabulous. Thanks, Lisa. Okay, bye-bye. Cheers. Uh, very good, very interesting, and uh, certainly inspiring, uh, if if anything is the word for me. Uh, and as we do, just the report of the day. Uh, our report of the day is from Tata Communications, leading in a digital first world. I thought this related to Lisa's interview. Skills are key are key issue to address. People and skills are just as important to consider as technology. 32% lacked relevant skills experience internally to design and plan adjustments for digital first interactions, 32% face challenges helping employees to get the most out of their new digital tools, 31% faced fundamental challenges adjusting to work from anywhere setups and collaboration with industry, and 31% had, uh, had difficulties integrating the complexity of their business supplier partner ecosystem. I think that's another thing that uh, maybe we didn't touch on with Lisa in terms of the changing work scale, uh, workforce uh, and the work environments as well is moving more towards STEM. Uh, and just a quick one on cybersecurity is lagging despite being a priority. So about 40% 40, 40 there uh, agree that there has been uh, sufficient investment in cybersecurity, 
but 41% there is a robust system in place to vet ecosystem interactions. So that's on the My Security Marketplace. Welcome to check it out. And otherwise, we'll be back on Friday morning, the APAC threat landscape with uh, WatchGuard. This will be 10 o'clock on uh, Friday morning this Friday. And uh, Corey is in Seattle and uh, Vincent is in Singapore. So looking forward to getting an overview of the APAC threat landscape and the 25 years celebrating uh, with WatchGuard. So thank you so much uh, for today and then joining us on our Tech and Sec Weekly. We'll be back on Friday morning. Thank you.